Funding for this film has been generously provided by the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. I'm Dan Harris in Signers Hall at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. We hardly think of it this way today, but to these men, this was an experiment. Starting a new type of government for a new country they were going to call the United States of America. Not only was there no guarantee that it would work, but history pretty much told them it wouldn't. In their day, nations were run by rulers, not rules. Kings and emperors told everyone else what to do. A government run by the people themselves? That was an old idea, but it had never quite worked. People fight with each other. It's human nature. People are messy. They have their own interests, and they disagree. All rulers knew that it took armies to keep the people under control. But these men believed it took a constitution, that they could create institutions that would let conflict occur, deal with it, and that people would accept the outcome. That's what they believed. And in the spring of 1787, it was time to deliver. But they weren't sure that they could. The Constitution was written in a time of crisis. They knew that if they failed at that moment, their country would fail. They responded by starting a nation in one room with just a handful of ideas and a small group of men. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Films like this really kind of miss the point. Protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Oh boy, they play right into the myth. A lot of the image that we have of the Founding Fathers comes in part from 19th century historians who actually wrote that God handed down the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson was a Founding Father. He was the one who wrote the Declaration of Independence. He called the men who wrote the Constitution demigods. So what did that make him? They're the closest thing we have to the Greek gods or, or royalty, and so they've been transformed into larger-than-life figures. For 200 years, we've written books about them. We've cast them in bronze, carved them from marble. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. We've made awful educational films about them. And you, James Madison. Our children's children will remember you. And the average school child in America is taught to speak of these men in kind of hushed whispers. They were all heroic figures who were going to be whisked directly up to heaven. In fact, everyday visitors to the nation's capital can walk into the heart of the rotunda, look up to the ceiling of the dome, and see a painting called The Apotheosis of Washington. In other words, George Washington becoming a god. These were real men who faced real challenges. They knew they weren't gods. Gods have special powers that men don't. And they didn't trust any man who wanted the power of a god or, say, a king. Many of them would blush or be embarrassed by the way we look up to them now. Well, some of them would anyway. We should admire them, not because they're superhuman, not because they're superman but because they are ordinary people. And that's what makes the real story so much more remarkable than the myth. Okay, for the record, Ben Franklin thought the Constitution would last, oh, about 10 years. Franklin and some of these men were actually brilliant, but they really didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Point was, they were trying to get out of a long, seemingly endless cycle of conflict. Let's go back for a minute. I'll make this quick. 150 years before the Constitution, we were separate colonies of Britain. We were ruled as the king saw fit. He could throw us in jail, make us pay unfair taxes, take our land. His word was the last word. I caused some conflict. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson and 55 other men risked their lives by signing the Declaration of Independence, telling Britain and the world that we weren't going to obey the king anymore. We fought a war to win our independence and started our own government in 1781, the Articles of Confederation. 
and the Articles of Confederation turned out to be a recipe for more conflict. Yeah, the first Constitution of the United States was a failure. The Articles of Confederation really did not bind the new states together into one nation. The Articles of Confederation were actually called a League of Friendship. What kind of a nation calls itself a League of Friendship? Remember that the colonists were revolting against England. They were revolting against a monarchy, and they were re revolting against a parliament that had total power. What they wanted to do was to prevent anybody or any group of people, any institution in this country from having that kind of power over their lives. You had groups of people who had existed for a fairly long time and identified themselves as Virginians or as people from Maryland or people from Massachusetts. North Carolina, where the wonders never cease. Delaware, it's good being first. They want what later would be called states' rights, state sovereignty. The states saw themselves as essentially sovereign nations that had kind of agreed to kind of maybe work together, maybe kind of, sort of. And things fall apart so quickly that it's really kind of dazzling. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, problems is that there was no power of taxation. Under the Articles of Confederation, the national government was flat broke. It couldn't afford to protect ships on the Atlantic from pirates, and it couldn't protect citizens on the western borders either. Each state printed its own money. Even more dramatically, New York State, which has the great port of New York City, is charging Connecticut and New Jersey an arm and a leg for everything that comes into their port. And so Connecticut and New Jersey are meeting to plan a united military attack on New York. But the breaking point for the Articles of Confederation came when veterans of the Revolutionary War, mostly farmers, staged a revolt against the state of Massachusetts. And in this scene, against the basic principles of acting. We're here to get justice. That's right. Right. Captain Daniel Shays, you are in contempt of court. I will see you jailed for this. Oh, no. You're not going to judge me or any other man in this county. You'll adjourn this court, or we'll clear you out. Now, yes. Shays' Rebellion sends fear through every state. What it represents is a breakdown of law and order. And all their rhetoric is the rhetoric of the revolution. This is a tyrannical government. This is a government that's not looking out for the interests of the people. When Washington hears about Shays' Rebellion, I think for him this is the low point of the whole Confederation period. General Washington, another such outbreak as this Massachusetts affair and we shall have anarchy. He said, it's a triumph for our enemies that we are incapable of governing ourselves. We can't even win the loyalty of our own citizens. Something has to be done. But what? Everyone knew this government needed to be fixed, but the big question was, how? A convention was called in Philadelphia to fix the Articles of Confederation. But just look around this room. These were the people who were coming to fix this mess? Just months before, this state was going to war with this state. Delaware came in saying they'd leave before they gave up any power. This delegation was arguing with itself over whether or not to commit to a stronger central government. And him? He was drunk. Only James Madison of Virginia came with a clear plan. Madison was a brilliant strategist, but he wasn't popular enough to get all these men to follow him. Poor James Madison, he arrives, nobody even notices him. They think he's a minister. He wakes up one morning and he hears church bells ringing and crowds cheering and he knows right away, he says, Washington has arrived. George Washington was the indispensable person when it came to 1787. He's the only person everyone in America has heard of. There's no CNN, there's no nightly news. He was famous throughout the world, I and mean, he defeated the most powerful nation in the world, you know, Great Britain. The you know, French hadn't been able to do it in hundreds of years. And then, instead of seizing power, he laid down power and went home and was a farmer. And this was incredible. He could be trusted because people knew he was not interested in wielding or gaining any kind of absolute power, that he had the best interests of the country at heart. Washington fought to establish a republic. And here he was less than four years after the war, trying to save it. Right away, they take care of the easy stuff. The convention unanimously chooses Washington to preside. 
After that, everything they talked about could have brought them big, big trouble. You know, the interesting thing about the Constitution's drafting is that it wasn't authorized. Illegal is too strong a word, but what they were doing was not permitted under the Articles of Confederation itself. These people had no authority under the previous system of government to do what they were doing. Not supposed to be a constitutional convention. This is a tweaking convention. It wasn't supposed to come up with a new constitution. Now it was just supposed to amend it. The third day of the convention, Edmund Randolph gets up and he says, Virginia thinks we should throw out the Articles of Confederation and write a new constitution. So on the third day of a convention called to make recommendations to amend the Articles of Confederation, they overthrow the government. <laughs> this was it, the moment of truth. These 55 men were either going to save the nation or they had just destroyed it. There was no turning back. They decided in order to accomplish this mission, they had to meet in secret. They really wanted to have an open and candid debate. They take a vow of secrecy. You're not supposed to say anything to anybody. And they all obey the rule. And they pay for it every day. They literally lock themselves in this room. You've seen the paintings, long hair, wigs. The northerners are wearing wool. Philadelphia is having a bad summer. I grew up in Philadelphia and it is oppressively hot and humid. It pours every day, and there is an invasion of great big bottleneck flies. And so people can't even open their shutters. And they're in a cooped up room with no air conditioning. The group buys Madison's idea, and it basically goes like this. A central government with three separate branches, a legislature, which was most important to these men, an executive to do what the legislature wanted, and a judiciary. And here's why. The three branches of government should keep each other in check. No one branch should become too powerful, kind of like a giant, very elaborate game of paper, scissors, rock. See, look, the president can't go to war unless Congress declares it. Congress can't create a law unless the president signs it. A president can't appoint a judge unless Congress confirms that nominee, and then the judge would serve for life and could one day strike down a law that both the President and Congress passed if that law violated the Constitution. Sounds difficult? A little complicated? Good. That's just the way they wanted it. The thing you notice most about the Constitution in reading it is the keen awareness that concentrated power is dangerous. It is almost as if uh, the whole thing was written to make making laws difficult. They expected legislators and congressmen to try to expand their powers. They expected the president to try to expand his powers, expected the courts to try to expand their jurisdiction. But by placing them in tension with each other, they thought they would block each other's overly ambitious actions. These men are anxious. Each and every one of them believes that powerful governments are dangerous. So they want to create something that, in a sense, they're afraid of. And the double irony of this is that the very people they don't trust with power is themselves, because they are going to be the leaders of that government. They start with the executive branch and can't decide if it should be a committee or just an individual. All that power might be too tempting for one person. He might try to take over and become a dictator or a king, or worse. And they can't decide how the president should be elected. Should the people vote for him directly, or should each state choose him? Near the end of the convention, someone comes up with a compromise called the Electoral College. In the Electoral College, voters choose a slate of representatives who then, uh, never mind. Ask your teacher. They move on to the discussion of Congress, and this is when it gets serious. The larger states wanted representation based upon population, and the smaller states wanted equal representation by state. Okay, proportional representation. Let's say Delaware's got one million people and Virginia's got 10 million. Suppose we give each state a vote in Congress for each million. Virginia's fat and happy with 10 votes. Delaware's got one. Bigger states rule they would have a much bigger voice in the national government. Madison wanted this because he thought a true national government should be elected by the people. And that states, well, 
we tried that with the Articles of Confederation. Remember? Oh, no. You're not going to judge me or any other man in this county. The people from the small states go berserk. Maryland will never give up her freedom. Nor will Connecticut, Mr. Martin. My state will never stand by to see Pennsylvania and Virginia rule the country. Neither will New Jersey. They were so torn apart. No, no. That some of the representatives, including one of the ones from Delaware, threatened to walk out and even threatened that some of the smaller states would make alliances with foreign countries. But it's not just large state, small state. This is the moment of truth. Are the states going to have, as states, a house, a, a, a platform in the government where their sovereignty is recognized? Or is this government going to be a government of the individual people? Is it going to be the United States of America or the United States of America? Even the men who believed in a strong national government knew they had to give in a little right now if this had any chance of working. One of the supporters of the Nationalist camp comes up to James Madison and says, corners him, and says, if you don't compromise, the small states are going to walk out of this convention and you will have destroyed the chance for the country to survive. This was it. The whole thing was on the line. So the next day, Connecticut's Roger Sherman came back with the idea of a bicameral legislature, which is a fancy way of saying two houses in one Congress. So now, to go along with the House of Representatives, there would be a Senate. The House would have proportional representation based on population. That made the Nationalists happy. And the Senate was the compromise. There, each state, big and small, would have two representatives. So Delaware would get the same number of votes in the Senate as Virginia. This made the Federalists happy. This is all in Article 1. And if you look closely, you'll see another big compromise, right here. Three-fifths of all other persons. Probably the biggest consideration regarding slavery in the Constitution is what's known as the Three-Fifths Compromise. Other persons was a code that everyone in the room understood. It meant slaves. And slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. To the framers, this wasn't a direct statement about a person's value as a human being. Equality, the end of slavery, they weren't there to talk about that. This was all about the power some states would have in the new Congress. If slaves were counted, even though they were slaves, then southern states would get more representatives in the House. Northerners didn't want slaves to count as whole persons because then the southern states would have more power. Half or more of the population in many of those southern states were slaves, so it means the more slaves a state has, the more political power it has. So in Philadelphia, the founders decided that almost everyone in the population would be counted. But not everyone counted would have rights or could even vote. The framers of the Constitution, the leaders of the Revolution, had a very limited idea about who was entitled to political rights. They did not believe in democracy. They did not believe that every man should have the vote. They certainly didn't believe that women should have the vote. They didn't believe that African Americans should have the vote. To have a vote in the 18th century, you had to have what they called a stake in society. That is, you had to have property, because it was their theory that you would make irresponsible decisions if you didn't have anything to lose. They didn't get things, some things right. I mean, clearly, we now realize if they, and many framers then realized that slavery was evil and should not be protected by our legal system. At the same time, it showed that they had to make compromises to get the Constitution through. If the Constitution actually prohibited slavery in 1788 and 1789, it probably never would have been ratified by the Southern states and we would not have had a Constitution at all. So you can also see sort of the practical aspect of people willing to make compromises, sometimes against the principles they believed in. They were making it up as they went along and they were making compromises for purely political reasons to get an agreement. They didn't believe for a moment it was an ideal constitution. It was simply the best one they could get in the circumstances. The story of the Constitution is too often told without acknowledging its problems. Not all of the compromises made in Philadelphia worked out. As brilliant as it was, the Constitution written in 1787 left slavery and state sovereignty unresolved. And 70 years later, these compromises led to the greatest constitutional crisis the United States has ever seen, the Civil War. To me, it's important to realize that the Constitution 
is not perfect. And it was never intended to be perfect. The framers themselves did not think it was perfect. So they made it possible to change it. That's why they wrote Article 5, Amendments. They knew they hadn't solved every issue. And there was one problem with their Constitution they'd have to fix almost as soon as the ink dried. Why didn't the framers at the Philadelphia Convention add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution? To us, it would seem obvious. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, we want it in there. You have to understand, every state had a Bill of Rights. Virtually every state had very carefully spelled out Bill of Rights. The guys wanted to go home. That's just the plain fact of it. And when someone said, should we have a Bill of Rights, everyone moaned because they thought, by the time we all argue over what should be in it and how many clauses, we'll be here another month. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments, and they weren't part of the original Constitution. The first Congress wrote the Bill of Rights, and it was ratified two years later. Finally, it was time to go home. They had created a Constitution, and it would last beyond their wildest dreams. I'm quite certain not a one of them would have imagined that in the early part of the 21st century, we would still be operating under their constitution. It would be as if you started a club with a bunch of friends in 2001 and someone said to you, what's the probability it'll be in existence in 2225? And so we have the legends, the coins, the statues. They're all part of the myth now. But their words tell the better story. They weren't gods, and they knew they weren't perfect. But they were pretty good. These are men who are remarkable largely because they were ordinary human beings facing a major crisis who did something that turned out really quite well. They were in a new world. They were away from all the old forms of government. And what they were saying is, we have an opportunity to create the right kind of government. What should that government be? They created a framework that is extraordinary in that it allows us to set in motion the kind of world we want to create for ourselves. Each year we have our parades and our fireworks on July 4th because our founding principles were first announced to the world with the Declaration of Independence. But it's the Constitution that allows us to live by those principles every day. A poor man interprets the Constitution and he changes America. It sounds like a fairy tale, but it's actually true. I'm here at the National Constitution Center, a place where you can learn about the framers, the Constitution, and its core values. This is the story of one poor man who didn't know much about American history, but he thought he'd been treated unfairly, and he knew just enough about the Constitution to do something about it. Now, you may think watching this today that your voice can't be heard or doesn't matter, but Clarence Earl Gideon changed the way we administer justice in this country, and he did it from a prison cell. 